Hi, it's Michaela back with another episode of Love Michaela, a podcast where I talk about literally anything and everything I want to. Um, today I will be talking about the K drama Tale of the Nine Tailed 1938, which is the second season of Tale of the Nine Tailed. So, sorry if I seem a little frazzled. I had a mic situation earlier and I thought my mic wasn't working. I ordered a bunch of new equipment. Um, I'm trying to cancel some of it now. We'll see if that actually goes through or not. Uh, if not, it's fine. Uh, I'll just have extra stuff so that way if this happens again, then I'm not panicking. Um, but yeah. Whew, okay. <laughs> so, um, if you have never seen the first season of Tale of the Nine Tailed and you want to, I would suggest, I'm going to turn myself down because I was really loud for a little bit there. I'm also working against the clock because the battery is not fully charged on my camera, unfortunately. So hopefully it doesn't shut off in the middle. I'm going to keep an eye on that. <laughs> but yeah, um, Tale of the Nine Tailed, if you haven't watched that first season and you plan to, I would suggest not watching this because this whole thing is going to be a spoiler. I would say if you don't mind, I was going to say little things being spoiled. It's big things. There are big things being that would be spoiled if you watch this first. Um, you could watch the seasons not in order, but it's not going to hit as hard if you don't watch the first season first. But if you're like, I don't really want to watch the first season at all. The first season is a rom-com. This season is more, I would say, of like an action buddy, not buddy comedy, but like it's more action packed and more about like friendship and sibling relationships versus a romantic relationship. And so if you're like not into the rom com aspect, then I would say that this is and you're you're cool with not having the full full story, then like go for watching this one first but yeah if you plan to watch the first one and you haven't yet do not watch this because the whole thing is going to be a spoiler okay i'm gonna give you like three seconds to leave okay you should be gone <laughs> um so i'm going to start out with first a synopsis again i have my timer going i'm keeping it on the battery so hopefully this doesn't go too long Ooh. It's already gone down two percent okay we're gonna keep going so okay the lights here's my synopsis <laughs> tale of the nine-tailed 1938 is the second season of tale of the nine-tailed eon our favorite gumiho has been sent to the past to retrieve an important stone but when he shows up he runs into some old friends and misses his chance to make it back to his home in time there's the ac Ooh, I can smell dinner cooking. <laughs> While stuck in the past, he reconnects with his loved ones, makes some new friends, and fights some new and old enemies. While balancing taking care of those in the past and retrieving what he needs to make it home, he also has to deal with the occupation of Japan because this is taking place in Korea during 1938, and whether or not to help with the fight for independence. Will he make it back to his own time, or will he be stuck in the past forever? Dun dun dun. I'm going to start out with everything spoiler free. Um, when I do hit spoilers, they will be chaptered on the YouTube video. Um, and I will also try and include timestamps in the description on Spotify. I have a lot to get through. There's four pages here of notes. I really love this show and I really love this season in particular. Um, so to do it justice, I, I hadn't watched it in a long time. So I rewatched it recently. And while I was watching it, I took a bunch of notes and I ended up with four pages. So I'm going to try and get through all of it before my battery dies and without going over an hour. But we'll see if that happens or not. Um, if this is cut into two different places, you're going to you'll know why. It's because the battery on my camera <laughs> died in the meantime. So spoiler free ahead. I'll warn you when there's spoilers. OK, cool. The intro to the show the song and the sequence that plays like when they're um uh showing each of the characters and the actors that play them i just realized i look kind of naked in the video sorry i have a shirt on i promise i have a shirt on the, i have a shirt on i have a shirt on okay <laughs> um the intro and the all the character descriptions and the way that it's shot it's really it's kind of like badass and it's very like flashy very action-packed very just big charactery comic book e those aren't real words but if you get what i'm saying like that's the kind of vibe that it is um it's just and it's a little goofy too and i think that that really sets the tone for the entire show because that's kind of the tone of the show it's action-packed it's big everything that's happening is done like 
it's it's big it's stylized and it's really goofy and i really really love it um i really love that while it's probably not entirely accurate in terms of history and things are definitely embellished and there's also obviously the inclusion of um different mythological creatures and that sort of thing I would say that um, it was really fun to get the little bits of some of the history that things that were going on during the Japanese occupation in Korea during that time. I, I don't even know if that's the correct terminology for it. It was awful. I will just say it was awful what Japan was doing to Korea at the time. <sighs> anyway, um, but I really loved that aspect of like getting a little bit of the history behind it. I really loved seeing the human side of it versus also the like mythological god demon side of it because they showed both sides and also like if they interacted or how they interacted and that kind of thing. And that was really fun to watch as well. Um, also, just a fun side note, the set that they were using is a set that they use every time they do anything during this time period i recognized it if you've seen korean odyssey which is another show that i might do another podcast on at some point but i'm gonna have to rewatch it because it's been forever i've watched it like five times so it's one of my favorites they use the same set for when they go back to this time period as well excuse me motorcycle thank you that was really fun and they also put little um blurbs up on the screen whenever there was like information to be had about like one of the like a historical thing that had happened or like one of the gods or demons that was being shown that was new like they had some indigenous gods that they kind of not intro well introduced on the show i'm sure that people who actually are familiar with korean folklore it's not new to them but like they did that and that was really fun because i'm someone who likes to look stuff up like that after the fact and so not having to look it up myself because it was already given to me was really um convenient I, I, I would look it up like if you want more information it was really just a basic description but um, that was really really nice to see as well I would say so I've got the main stories of what happens in the show so the main stories are the resistance against Japan's occupation the mountain gods and their relationship and um, again this is a spoiler free section it does include some of the stuff that happens obviously in the first episode as well as some of the stuff from the second episode but those two episodes a lot of the stuff that happens in those are kind of included in the trailer and so I feel like it's not really a spoiler in that sense because it's included in the trip like the teaser trailer for it if you look up up, like if you're like oh I might want to watch the show and you look it up like this stuff is basically everything that's included there I'm not gonna try and spoil like anything else um yeah the mountain gods and their relationship I say that because they show one of the other mountain gods also it was talked about in like um press releases that the mountain gods was going to be like a big part of it um and then the other one is the fox brothers which is Irong and Eon. Eon is the main character and Irong is his little brother those are kind of the main stories. There's also another one that happens throughout, um, but I will talk about that later because it's kind of a spoiler. So the characters that I can talk about without spoiling anything. Eon. This character is so fun to watch. He's so in control, but also so goofy and clumsy, which is such a fun dynamic to watch a person play. Um, he's very powerful, but also he's like a little stupid sometimes, which is fun to watch. And, um, the actor who plays him, Lee Dong-wook, is incredible. Just one of the best actors I've ever seen, ever. He's so funny. He's so charismatic. He's really great at doing these action-heavy roles. Like, he does stunts really well, and he, like, is really giving it his all. He does drama really well. He does the gentle romantic side of things really well. He's just, he has so much range. He's so good. If you don't know who he is, you must not watch K dramas ever because he's in so many things. He was in Touch Your Heart, loved him in that. He's in this. He was in um the Goblin Goblin one. Goblin. I can't remember the full title of it. Tokebi. Y'all know. If you know, you know. Uh he played the Grim Reaper. Um he was like a creepy character in uh Strangers from Hell. That was a really I wouldn't say that was a really good one. It was interesting. It was a little slow for my liking, but it was still good. Like the acting was amazing in it, of course. Im um Im Shiwan was in it as well, and I love him too as an actor. Um, but yeah, Lee Dong Wook, incredible actor. He's just he's great. I really like. I couldn't even give you so many specifics because we would be here for like an hour, and we don't have time for that. So, um, but yeah, so Eon is the Kumiho, the main character, played by Lee Dong Wook. 
Irang is um, another character that's a main character in the show. He is um, Dong Wook characters i'm gonna call him yon he's yon's um half brother he's um half fox and half human and he's a very complex character he's dealing with a lot of abandonment issues and other issues that he has not worked through at all which leads to a very complicated complex character that you love but also hate um i love him and i love the actor who plays him kim bomb is truly an incredible actor i loved seeing more of him because we didn't see as much of him in the first season because the first season was more focused on the romance between um eon and his forever love whose name i can't remember right now but she's played by joe boa i think is her name um and she was great too but yeah kimbo my love um i think he's an incredible actor he's got great range just like dong does but i feel like he brings a more subtlety to a lot of his characters which is so fun to watch and just the intricacies that he applies to his characters he's so specific about his characters and that just makes them so much more interesting and i find that really admirable and i even um purchased an online course of like a class basically that he taught that I still have access to I need to rewatch it because I only have it for I think a couple more months at this point because you have access to it for a year and um he the way he approaches his character and building his character and its emotions the character's emotions and the arc that the character goes through is so incredible and so cool in such an interesting and unique way sorry I'm just gonna look at the okay uh the battery of my camera I know I'm talking so fast I'm so sorry yeah um you can't do much else about it bud if you see me change locations also so i can get closer so i can plug my camera in to record so it's charging while i'm recording that might be a thing that happens just a heads up um spotify you guys won't know you'll you won't know i'll have cut out the middle part of the audio anyway so it doesn't matter but anyway um it, it he's just a great actor to watch i love watching him work and i love him specifically as rong because i think the character is so complicated and he does it so well um another main character in the show is hongju she is one of the other mountain gods she's introduced in the teaser trailer i mean you don't really know who she is but like come on and it's talked about in a lot of the blurbs and teasers that came out um in the articles so i'm not gonna think it's a spoiler um she's really badass she's very sultry she's very confident and sure of herself and i love that about her i love a strong woman who doesn't um and she's so funny and she makes these choices not I think honestly I think there were actor choices as well not just written things like stuff that's written into the script she makes these choices that are so out there and bold that you're like why this shouldn't work but it does and I think that's so incredible I don't know the actress's name so sorry I should have looked it up um I did look it up I didn't write it down for whatever reason um but she was incredible she's a great actor I'm sure I don't know if I've seen her in anything else, but I wouldn't be surprised if she's in other things because she is so good. Um, And I love that the character Hongju just has this really big heart. I think all of the characters in the show really have a big heart, but they show it in different ways. And she's so protective and so strong, but also like loves to play the dainty side as well. And I just, she's just a great character. I loved watching her. (laughs) She's just so funny. Um, there were also a few characters that were, um, repeated, repeats from the last season, from the very first season. Um, one of them who is not the same character at all, plays a totally different character. I'm not going to go into detail on that just so I don't spoil it because I don't think it's in the first two episodes. I think it's in like the third or fourth, but, um, this character is like, it's a, it's the same person, but it's like a new character a la American Horror Story essentially. But, um, that was really fun to see them because I think the base is the same, but the like flavor and like the nuances to it on top of it are very different. And so it was really fun to see this person play, um, a little bit of a different character with a little bit of a different arc and different relationships with the people who are with the cast in the show. That was really fun to watch. I actually think I prefer them in this character than in the last one, to be honest. Um, there were also characters returning as themselves, but they were the older version because this is in the past. Not older, but like the, I guess, younger technically version because it's in the past. Um, and so it was fun to see them before they had a little bit more. Like, it's like going back in the character development. It was fun to see like who they had been at the time. Like one of them was more timid than they had been. One of them seemed a little bit more like go and get it ready to like do things like a mover and shaker um that was really fun to watch i think a big aspect of the good part of the show is the relationships in the show 
the brothers bond and seeing how it has changed because Eon is coming from the future and he's a lot more healed as a human than he is in this current time. Like we meet Eon's character from 1938. Like he meets himself kind of a loser. Um, he's an addict, like he's addicted to opium. He is very heartbroken over his first love and still not having found her yet. He finds her in the first season, so it's fine. Um, but just kind of a loser, <laughs> beating people up for no reason. Just, you know, not the best, which, you know, is a testament to Lee Dong Wook is like, I don't know. He's just a very likable guy in general. And so I think the characters he plays end up being like, he's able to play them in a way that makes them all likable, even when they're not the best. Um, and so that is a fun thing to see, but his character is kind of a loser. Yeah. But when he comes to the past from the future, um, it's interesting to see the relationship with his brother and how that has changed because in the first season, spoiler alert, his brother, um, dies for him, like sacrifices himself his younger brother sacrifices himself for him and so now he gets to see his brother again who he never thought he'd see and he's so full of love and he knows like deep down his brother just loves him and wants him to love him back and show that um even though Nong like wants to hide it all the time so it's interesting to see how that dynamic plays out but also interesting to like see the aspect of okay is he being so kind to him because he really does just love him or is there also is it either fully from this place or also is there a point of like some of it's coming from some guilt because his brother died for him? I think that's fun as an actor to play with and also just to see as an audience member like watch how that kind of plays out. And then spoiler alert later on in the show, Rang finds out that he does sacrifice himself for his brother um, from a different character and is like, that doesn't sound right. But then he like thinks about more. He's like, no, I think I actually would do that. And to see him be like, oh, well, he's just being nice to me because he feels guilty versus does he actually love me and seeing how that kind of plays out um in the show sorry I just realized I'm not in the spoiler section of this and I spoiled things I'll mark those in the thing or cut them out we'll see what happens I'll figure it out I don't have time for you know anyway 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 man I just spoiled some heavy things okay yes the relationship it's very fun to see the brothers bond and how it has changed over time um Eon has yeah yeah I'm going to stop there before I spoil anything else. Ah, am I going to have to film this again later? I hope not. Um, there's also, well, some of it's spoilers because from the first season and some of it's spoilers for this. But, okay. Relationship between the friends um, of the the mountain gods, which is um, Eon is a mountain god. He's a gumiho, but he's also one of the mountain gods. And Hongju is also one of the other mountain gods. Um, I feel like it's not a spoiler to talk about because they, again, they talked about it in like the press releases and stuff for it. Um, and it's interesting to see their relationship and how they became friends. Um, and it's also really fun to see the relationship between their, I don't want to call them sidekicks, but that's kind of what they are, the sidekicks of each of these main characters. So Mion is um, Rang's like, right-hand man, um, a member of his gang. Jeyu is Hongju, um, Hongju's right-hand man. And Shinju is um, Eon's right-hand man who we've met in the first season already. And it's fun to see their dynamic play out between the three of them and how they grow as a little trio in the show. First kind of being completely separate and then seeing how that progresses. Um, or does it progress? I don't know. Do they still hate each other by the end of it? We don't know. Again, this is a spoiler-free section. So sorry about the other two previous spoilers. Again, I'll, I'll mark it down uh, in the information. So don't worry you'll be able to see it and skip it but yeah I also want to say one of the things I loved about the season without spoiling anything I need to remind myself now it was way scarier than the first season in my opinion but it was also also way goofier way more action-packed it's basically like I feel like they upped everything like if the last season was a five they brought it up to like a 12 in this season and it made it so much more fun and engaging to watch it's definitely a show you can binge watch for sure I watched it as it came out but I've been binge watching it could I have been I could have binge watched it I don't think all in one day because it's 12 episodes and they're each about an hour long I guess I could if I really tried but I've been really busy with work and keeping stuff updated on the YouTube so that's taken a while but um you could totally binge watch this. It's very, very good. And it's very, it's very fast paced and it keeps moving and keeps moving and keeps moving. And there's also like mini stories in between of things that are happening. So it's, it's, it's really like, it keeps you on your toes. Like it's not something you'll get bored watching, I don't think. Um, and I also want to just say like, 
with the even with the lack of romance being the center because I'm very much a rom-com girly um I still really enjoyed it and I I honestly think it's my favorite like I like it better than the first season even though the first season is the rom-com season because it's focused on Eon and his relationship with Alm I think is her name um the the his like one and only love for his whole life um that's what that whole season is focused on but I still liked this one more I think just because the relationships were so dynamic in the show and um they were so interesting and the story itself was interesting and then also the ask the like historical like occupation aspect of it was really interesting to watch as well um the few downsides that I can talk about without spoiling anything um I don't know how this fits into the timeline of things like in the reality of this world because he's going back in time he even meets his past self but then he's told at the beginning like oh what you do here won't affect anything don't worry and time moves differently here so is it like a pocket dimension is it like he's creating a parallel alternate universe with the changes he's made like I don't know that's very confusing for me (laughs) you can't think about it too long because it doesn't make sense so Uh, that's one of the things not really a downside downside it's just like in my head like I'm like where does this fit into things and how could the story continue if this is happening basically is why I'm like oh not my favorite thing my other issue is the ending was fine it wasn't fully satisfying if you know you know that I don't mind a sad ending or a happy ending I prefer happy endings but I don't mind a sad ending as long as it is satisfying it was just shy of being fully satisfying for me and I'll talk about that more in the spoiler section but it was just like there was a thing that happened that I was like ah we could have left that out and it would have been a closed chapter of a book essentially and it it kind of wasn't it was but it wasn't um it could also be a bias because I love this cast and this story so much that I do want another season so that could also just be why I was like oh not super satisfying because I'm like I want more we'll see that's not necessarily a bad thing though okay now is for real spoiler sections ahead it's all spoilers okay I know I already messed up once this is all spoilers okay okay be prepared for that you need to click out if you plan to watch the second season and you don't want spoilers okay okay final warning leave (laughs) if you don't want spoilers leave now click ahead to the other timestamps to the other chapters got it okay we're gonna keep moving keep the train moving okay spoilers the characters um for Irang, I couldn't talk about him too much in the first one because it's a bunch of spoilers but um seeing his so one of the storylines is he has a love interest now I've never seen him in a romantic interest like this heavily before he kind of was I didn't watch him in Boys Over Flowers sorry I didn't see him in that one yet uh I can't even bring myself to finish the first version of it that I tried so yeah there's that and he kind of had one in law school but not really they weren't like overtly having a rom com moment thing but in this he definitely has a romance and him and the mermaid Yohi it's very fun to see how they interact and how she like makes him feel it's very clear that Irong has a big heart and is very scared of being abandoned and very afraid of He's the kind of person, because his heart is so big, he's the kind of person that attracts people to build a family, but he's so afraid of being abandoned again because we see he was abandoned by his father first, he's abandoned then by his mother who is human, who thinks he's a monster, he's beat up by people in the village, kicked out of the village, left in the forest where he's found by his older brother Yon, who takes care of him for a while and then abandons him also because, and in his whole mountain, because he um, wants to go and be with this human woman that he's fallen in love with. And so he's severe abandonment issues. It's very clear. It's very clear that this leads to a lot of self-sabotage on Rang's part. It's just interesting to see him now be loved by someone who's fully like, no, I'm not going to let you go. Like, I love you and I want to be around you and I will help you in whatever way I can. But like, this is it like this is it buddy I'm not leaving like I love you and I want to be around you okay I love that and I love to see how that kind of changed him and how even like like there's a moment where she tells him to she wants a kiss from him as a payment for like a debt he owes her and he turns away and I was like really shocked because I was like I really thought that they kissed I thought they kissed in this episode did they not like I was like did my memory betray me and no they do kiss it's just he turns away because he doesn't want it to be a form of payment he wants it to be like a very valid feeling between the two of them and then they do kiss and it's really cute um was I jealous yes very jealous because one I like him I think he's cute and two like he's a great actor and I'd love to share a moment like that with him um because I feel like you'd really be feeling it in the moment yeah I just thought that that, I, I I love him I love his character and I love the actor 
Mu Young couldn't talk about him before the spoilers um, because he is the other we we find out he's the other mountain god and um, he's kind of a villain in the beginning. Um, I fully wondered whether he had the full story if he knew he was a villain or not. I know some of these shows film kind of like in order and so sometimes people don't find out that they're dying or that they're the bad guy or like some big plot twist. They don't find out until the day that they're like filming it or like the day before they're filming it because they get the script a little bit early. Um, and so I wonder if he had the whole story or not, because this character was so complex. The story is that he is also one of the mountain gods, but he is sealed away because he destroyed his whole mountain. He destroyed his whole mountain because his brother was killed by Yon. And that's why he is fighting Yon. And he is actually the bad guy because he is trying to revive his older brother. I'm for sure going to have to change locations just a head up, heads up. When this hits 10%, I'm moving locations, plugging that baby in because I don't have time to refilm this again. <laughs> Ooh, Spotify though, you guys don't have to worry about that. Don't worry. You you won't even you won't even be able to tell, but my friends up here on YouTube, yeah, you'll know. You just he's a complicated person, which makes a complicated villain, and he's also the kind of person that you can tell does not at all one like he's not he's like the kind of guy who won't hurt a fly but he's become like this because he's so bent on getting first of all his revenge for what happened to his brother for young killing his older brother and then second of all he's trying to revive his brother because that's what his brother's telling him to do so he's listening to his older his older brother like that's what he's doing that's what he thinks he's supposed to be doing right now um spoiler alert because this is the spoiler section now thank goodness he shouldn't be doing any of this because it's not his brother he thinks it's his brother and it's not um and you just you can see the revenge and the thirst for revenge really change a person by watching his character especially when they're showing the flashbacks and how he was living when he first started to like come back to life essentially versus him now like he's so much more twisted and like very you just he's just hurt he's so hurt and you can see that in him and I think that that's really a testament to how amazing of an actor this dude is but also just like the story was written in such a way that it's very it's easy to tell like what kind of person he was and how revenge has changed him and he still kept some parts of himself like it's very obvious he as much as he hates it he still cares for yon he very much still cares for hongju who he was in love with when they were little um like you can tell that he's the kind of person who like it's like it's killing him inside to become this person who's hurting other people because he hurts innocent people in the show as well you can tell that it's killing him inside to be doing those things but he also thinks he owes it to his brother he has to do this it's not even a question of whether he can or not it's he's going to if he dies trying and it's incredible to watch that and it makes for a very complicated villain it makes you it makes the viewer feel complicated about how they feel about this person as well um and because these characters are all so complicated because there's also moments where Hongju is making choices and you're like whoa girl what are you doing like because she her character loves um Yeon he doesn't love her obviously um and sometimes she does stuff and I was like girl you're better than this (laughs) and sometimes she does stuff because like you think it's because of him and then you're like oh no she's doing it to protect the other girls like she is the head of like a gisang house um and she's doing it to she's doing some of this stuff to just protect her girls and her people and so it's very fun to see these three characters and their relationship first they show flashbacks of them when they were kids and then it goes on to show them now as adults to see how they've changed as they've grown how they've changed because they're all from different time periods because Mu Young's character also came from the future um and to see how they've all kind of changed as time has changed them and how their different relationships with other people affect their relationships with each other. And these three people who very much love each other, but also kind of hate that they love each other, but also like are willing to go to great lengths to protect the other people around them, even if it means harming these two other people that they very much care about that they grew up with like there's a whole section where they show like oh we'll never betray each other and they take this comb that they stole from Tuluipa I don't know how to say her name um who's the one who turned them into mountain gods and they they stole her like precious comb they broke it into three and they were like okay the three of us like this is our sign and it's like a symbol that's used throughout the show to like show how much that they care about each other but they're still like they still all they like they all love each other and care about each other but they have three different like each of them has 
a different goal and to see how those interfere but also help out each other in some ways is so so fun to watch um yeah so that's cool before i get on to the next segment uh you'll you'll see me in a hot minute i'm gonna change locations really quick all right all right okay we're back (laughs) we're back um let me restart this oh i hope i'm not too too loud now i feel like i'm way closer okay okay um you if you watch other videos on my record uh, what about that <laughs> if you watch other videos on my youtube channel you would recognize this um, type of setup it's for my gate it's the same thing i use for my gaming but i have to my outlet is right there i don't have a cord long enough i really need to get more batteries for this anyway i left off talking about the characters and what i loved about them Ooh, i'm gonna make sure i'm, I'm thinking i'm really like way louder because i'm a lot closer now okay i'm gonna turn it down just gotta double check on my levels and that kind of a thing no need to worry maybe split the difference hello hello okay (laughs) cool also if you didn't notice i have this is my little buddy i love them um it's a new jeans bunny that i just got anyway that's who i'm holding on to um we'll see if i talk way faster or if i don't i'm also just gonna take it's nice to be here because i can have a sip of things it's tea also not sponsored and this isn't from them but i got this cup there we go um from the vicky rakuten booth at kcon and it's really really cute and i and i love it sorry the lights they've been doing that if you've uh, been watching my gaming stuff you'll know that it's been an issue with the lighting um yeah anyway back to the show (laughs) spoilers also we're still on spoilers um maybe i'll mark down where this little transition happened because i want you guys to see my little bunny buddy um if you can yeah okay back into spoilers um yeah i think the relationships made this show really really interesting to watch i got my notes here don't worry (laughs) uh like i said before in the non-spoiler section i really felt that this one was way scarier than the last season had been um one of the things that really contributed to this which is like one of the things that has stuck with me since I watched it the first time is they play this corner game and the corner game leads to them going into I believe it's called like the land between death and life or something like that um and it's where this the Joseon Tiger lives who is very creepy um able to mimic like everything that he can do is really scary and terrifying because he almost seems like he can overpower the mountain gods which like we had not really seen before and um he's in a space where taluipa taluipa i again still don't know how to say her name um where she cannot see which is like unheard of and so it's it's very scary but like yeah and his whole deal is kind of scary because he's he's like a master imitator that's kind of his thing and then there's a whole moment where he's imitating Yon and Nong is like do I fall for this do I not and almost gets like pulled in and it's like one of the scariest things I've ever seen but anyway so there's this thing there's this thing uh they play this game called the corner game the gi songs gi sings not gi songs gi sings um we're having a educational math lesson with um one of the other characters um and the lights the electricity goes out and they're like oh well we can't keep learning because it's too dark to learn and so instead they decide to play the corner game um so i've written down what the corner game essentially is you can google this um if you google the corner game stuff will come up i'm gonna try to not walk my face with this guy i've never done this setup like this before you usually aren't this close to me um hmm that's probably fine um i looked it up you can google it there's different rules i'm gonna kind of go over what i googled in conjunction with um the way that they played it in the show so if it's a little bit different there's some variations on it that's why so the corner game an urban legend type of game that originated somewhere in east asia likely korea or japan um that's said to summon a dead spirit or sometimes can send someone to another world so the way you play it is at least in the show because I've read that it's five people, but in the show, they do four people. So four people enter an empty room and each pick a corner to stand in. So imagine we're using my room. So we have 
one corner over here, this corner back here, the dead zone, if you know, you know. There's another corner over here by my door, and then another corner here, right? Four corners, it's a square rectangle room, right? Like most rooms. Um, each So four people, each person stands in a corner. Again, I'm going off of the show, and if you look it up, they'll explain how to play with five people. Each person stands in a corner, and then in the show, this is how they did it. I think the rules were a little bit different when I looked it up, because it's like you say your name three times or something like that. I don't know. But anyway, in the show, uh, they each say their name the normal way, forwards, to start the game. And if you want to finish the game, you have to say your name backwards, which not that I think about it if I were to play the game, which I would never because this is scary and I don't mess with stuff like that, typically, um, especially when it's called a game uh you would say your name backwards I don't know how I would do that but like a lot of um Korean names are like two syllables technically like if it's just your first name and not your last name and so you would say the syllables in the opposite order so it's not necessarily like fully backwards at least in the show that's not how they did it but like I don't know how I would do my name very interesting to think about um Anyway, you say your name backwards to end the game. The lights should be out except for like a few lights on in the middle of the room so you can kind of see where you're going. So in the show, because the power was out, they were like, it's the perfect time to play the corner game because they just light some candles and put those in the center of the room. Um, they And in the show, they, they say their name forwards. The game starts. The way you play the game is there's a person in each corner. So one here, one here, one over here, one over here. The first person who starts will then move clockwise to the next corner. So I guess... It would be this way in here. I don't know if this is going to be reversed or mirrored for you or not, but you know, you you kind of get what I mean. Um, so I'm just going to move that down a little bit so you can see my face a little bit better. Um, so from one corner, this person would then move to the next corner. And then in the show, you, oh, almost forgot. This is so important. You don't speak during the game at all. If you speak, you could ruin everything. Important. Um, you start the game each person's in a corner this person will move to the next corner in the show they tapped the next person on the shoulder and then that person would move to the next corner tap that person on the shoulder move into their corner and so on and so on and so on so you're basically trading corners with people but you can't speak while you're playing the game um if while you're playing the game you see an extra person during the game or a missing person like someone goes missing while you're playing the game that's when the game is over because you've either met the spirit that you've called through by playing this game or you've sent someone to another world so <laughs> great um and it's time to say the, your name backwards because game's over we don't want to do it anymore we're done um in the show they made it seem like you they wanted to meet a spirit from the other world because like they thought they could ask it questions about their future or whatever um there's instructions online on what to do if you're missing a person i don't remember what they were i didn't write that part down because it didn't happen well it did happen in the show but they didn't do it according to those rules like they didn't say the person according to those rules um yeah then the game is over and you turn the lights back on um yeah, there's different variations of it if you Google it, but the show, it was it's very scary to watch in the show. In the show, they're playing the game, and then the girl who goes missing taps someone on the shoulder. They don't respond, and she's like, oh, that's weird. Like, she, you see she makes a face. She's like, okay. Um, she doesn't say anything, and then she hears her own voice. She's not saying anything, but she hears her own voice saying, guys, I'm kind of scared. Can we stop playing now? And she's like, oh! <gasps> oh my gosh, like we're not supposed to speak during this and it sounds like I spoke but I didn't speak so she turns around to everyone and her, like her actual voice and her actual voice, she actually says, guys, that wasn't me. I didn't say anything and that was her speaking and then she, and then all the girls were like, <gasps> like panicking and she vanishes. Like she spoke. She broke the rules of the game. She spoke. You're not supposed to speak and so she she vanished. Um, terrifying. Horrifying. Very scary. L truly was awful. <laughs> awful in the best way like I like being scared um so that was really really fun to watch it was very scary and it really stuck with me and also like it reminded me of I f I feel like I don't know if I made this up to be honest but I feel like I read somewhere this like urban legend like creepypasta kind of thing and it was like some kind of story where it's like oh if you stare in the corner of your room for too long you will be transported to another dimension or you will um call something forth and something will come out of the corner i think it's interesting that it seems like at least peripherally corners are seen as this like portal to another world or dimension and that you can it's like that's where things are thinning and things can maybe pass through that weren't supposed to pass through 
that seems very interesting to me very fun and when I was looking up reasons why I didn't really find much but it was said that like corners typically tend to be darker spaces whether it's like a poorly not poorly lit but whether it's not a like super lit room or it's just like nighttime that corners tend to be kind of dark areas where we don't really travel to like you're not really sitting in a corner a lot of the time like you might put things in corners but you don't really go to corners and hang out there typically maybe if you have like a little reading nook or something you do but um so they're kind of seen as like almost an unknown and humans typically I mean I know I do find things that are unknown pretty scary and so it leads to this idea that oh there's like another portal here it goes to somewhere else and that's why we avoid it because we're afraid of it because we don't want to go to the unknown essentially which I think is fun and also kind of ties into my whole corner being a dead zone so that's kind of cool I guess in a way it is a spooky month October after all um but that that scene like that whole section of the show very much stuck with me for really a long time like it's the one thing that really really stood out to me and I was like oh yeah this show was scary because that that'll get me every time like even just thinking about it I'm like Ooh. oh man like it it's good the way that they did it was really good and then they do it again to save her like the the three mountain gods do this again to save her and um even then it was scary even though I know that these are powerful beings it's like oh man like it's, it's scary it's very scary very spooky and it was fun to watch um there's also some other like aspects of it that I was like oh that's kind of fun like the supernatural like I don't know if it's witchy per se but like the supernatural aspects of it were like which also later on like there's a, a bunch of different rituals that have to happen in the show for various reasons one of them is Mu Young like like I said before he's trying to bring back his brother to get revenge and also because he misses his brother and wants his brother back and it's very clear while he's doing the ritual which I don't know if I already said this but it's not his brother it's someone else trying to get him to bring him back is disastrous but the ritual he does to bring this man back you're like Mu Young honey (laughs) like it looks bad it doesn't look like something to bring someone back in a nice way it it, like seems to it looks like a ritual that's being done to bring back like a malicious spirit someone who has malicious intent like you're like dude maybe not the best move maybe not the smartest brightest move and we shouldn't have done that um but it it was definitely interesting to watch and I also thought it was really fun that um Eon Eonguk's character the the Gumiho the nine-tailed fox um he misses his deadline to get back the first time with the stone and so his next chance to get back they're like oh well you can only do it during a lunar eclipse and so he has to go back during a lunar eclipse which I was like oh that's fun because if you've watched my let's play you know I I talked about how much I like the moon and feel connected to the moon there was a solar eclipse recently that happened um I did a little vlog during it it'll probably come out after this because this needs to go out like ASAP which is why it's kind of janky setup like I'm switching where I'm sitting even though like yeah um anyway uh I did like a little vlog during it I made some eclipse water because I guess that's a thing you can do um and I actually might use it soon uh it's good for I guess and my sister said specifically there wasn't anything like really blocking this one I don't remember exactly what she said something about things not being blocked so it was especially good to make eclipse water during this one that was like because it's like more pure I guess and it's really good at cleansing things I've been having again if I've, I don't know if I've said it in my other podcast I feel like I've talked about the dead zone a lot but I don't know if I've talked about this I've been having bad nightmares a lot I just haven't been sleeping well recently I keep waking up at 3 a.m I keep waking up in the middle of the night just multiple times um just just nightmares just constant nightmares it, maybe it's because I'm watching this show and it's scary <laughs> Uh, I was also watching another show where there was a girl, the the character in it was being stalked. Um, and I've had dreams of being stalked a lot and just watched. Like, stalked, not stalked like someone's following me, but stalked as in like someone, like, uh, there's always someone like outside my window or like watching me and taking pictures of me. And it's like really creepy and gross. And it just leaves me, I don't know if like uh, my body is panicking while this is all happening. And so, it probably honestly is. And so I'm not getting good sleep and good rest when I'm doing all of this like doing all this being sleeping um so I'm waking up really tired I hope you can't tell but I feel like I have like really bad bags now anyway um so I'm thinking of using the eclipse water to do like a little cleansing I might as well just do it in the corner I mean my my head is over there anyway when I sleep so I feel like it kind of works out um 
I might do a little something like there's like simple things you can do just to cleanse things so I'm not calling anything in not you know doing anything crazy just trying to make the area more clean I guess I might just like sweep just to get some of that energy out I don't know we'll see um I'll probably talk about it later on but um yeah it was cool to see like some of the more spiritual stuff coming through on this show too I really liked that and that it wasn't just a fantastical thing it was like rituals and stuff that actually makes me think I should talk about the other cage room I watched where the girl was being stalked because there's a lot of like spells and stuff in that and that was really fun I'm gonna talk about that eventually yeah just putting a pin in that but that is something that's gonna be on the back of my mind yeah but that was really cool um and um so that was really fun to see another thing that I really loved that is a spoiler is uh, there was a part where um the Japanese demons because again uh, in case you weren't aware it is 1938 there is a Japanese occupation happening in Korea really bad very it's bad it's bad they're doing awful awful horrendous war crimes um and one of the they they tied that in with the Japanese demons who were also soldiers um and they they were doing sorry the with the ac coming on i know it's noisier for you guys but also i can smell the dinner and i'm getting hungry because it is six o'clock because i've been trying to film this for a long time anyway not important moving on um the japanese demons were running tests on the korean demons and like gods and deities that they were running into and jailing they would run tests on them they were doing this experiment with this thing called the i'm not going to say it wrong because i feel like i might say a bad word if i say it wrong this whistling tree i'm not going to say what the korean thing was because i can't remember i didn't write down because i didn't think i was going to go into detail on this um they're doing um like research like experiments on that and it made me think like oh like that was one of the things that made me go like oh i need to look up like was japan which i wouldn't have been surprised if they were was japan doing experiments on korean citizens during this time period because why wouldn't they 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 were awful um because it was bad i looked it up and there was a unit that was famous a japanese unit called unit seven i wrote it down 731 and they would experiment on prisoners of war but when i looked it up it said most of these people were chinese and not korean so i was a little confused i was like huh they must have experimented i know that they did a lot of like countless other awful things to korean citizens while they were occupying the land but um i was like oh i really am surprised that there isn't more information on this and then when i looked into it further i found that this unit was also known as the Kamo unit and in episode two of this show um where's his name (laughs) i wrote it down i wrote it down i wrote it down i wrote it down hold on hold on Shinju. Shinju, who is Dongwook's um, right-hand man, does not enter 1938 with him because there's this whole issue um, where they don't end up traveling together. And um, he ends up stuck with this group of people who are going to become a part of the Kamo unit. Um, and I was like, oh, that's how that tied into that. Because they're on, they're, he stuck with them on the train. But then they escape and he, like, frees them, essentially. Which was cool. But also I was like, oh, okay, that's how that ties in. That was really fun to, like, look into that and figure that out. Um, what else? Oh, the romance. So, did I already mention this? There's a romance. I did a little bit when I talked about his character. The romance between Dong and the mermaid so he i wrote it down yo he sorry between him and her it was very fun to see how they changed each other it was very sweet it was cute to see like her trying to like flirt with him and like start things with him and then he would have a reaction that she was like that is not at all was what i was expecting but it was still very sweet like but sweet in his way i really loved that and i loved seeing how um they both changed each other like she became a lot prouder more confident her in herself and like because she was also half to um and she was like proud of her voice now because she used to think her voice was ugly she just wanted to be able to sing pretty but she could use her voice as a weapon and Rong was like that's the best part of you like that's so cool that you can defend yourself and protect yourself like that because he finds stuff like that cool and then to also see how she kind of mellowed him out a little bit and he became a bit more softer he was able to accept help a little bit more easily not fully but a little bit more easily and that was fun to see um he found more self-worth in himself and that was lovely um to watch 
Um, I the there were four Japanese demons, five actually, but there were four Japanese demons initially, and um, it was cool. Their Japanese, at least to my ears, sounded very very good. I feel like we could have done something different with hair and makeup, or maybe cast some other people. They did really good though. They were good actors, and their Japanese sounded really really good. Um, but they did they all look Japanese to me? No. And you might be like, ah, oh, you can't really tell. You could tell. Most of us can tell, especially if you're East Asian or Asian. Most of us can kind of tell like, oh, this person is probably this, but maybe could be this. Like, I could tell that they were fully Korean. Like two of them, I was like, oh, they did a good job with the casting and also with like hair and makeup where they like looked like I was like, they could totally pass for Japanese. I was like questioning myself even. I was like, oh, maybe they're part Japanese because, you know, that, that can happen. Not necessarily all for good reasons, but that can happen um, sometimes for good reasons. But, mm, you know. Um, some of them though, I was like, oh, they, these are just fully Korean men. These are fully Korean men. I could tell. Like, I was like, okay, maybe we could have done a little bit different, but we didn't. That's fine. Whatever. Um, it is what it is. But their Japanese was very good and they were really good actors. So I don't blame them for who they cast because they did a phenomenal job. Um, I also thought it was cool that the demons, the Japanese demons kind of had powers, at least two of them did have powers that were like in tandem with two of the the two korean ooh, mountain gods not yon but um the other two muyong and hongju because hongju is really strong and one of the japanese ones uh was very very strong like that was kind of his thing and then the the girl the yuki ona was um she it, it's a snow woman so she can control like ice basically make things cold and muyong can control fire so that was really fun to see them kind of fight each other um, and see how that kind of played out. That was fun. And then another little tidbit that I thought was fun is before they fight, they're in different hotel rooms and the Japanese demons are in hotel room 404, I believe, or maybe it's 414. I don't know. It's 404, I think. And, um, there's four in there, which is like an unlucky number in Japan because, you pronounce numbers in different ways depending on what you're counting but one of the ways you pronounce it sounds like the word for death in Japanese and so that was really fun to see um that little tidbit I was like oh that's fun like what a little fun piece of information because like they're the I think they were called the shiri shirigami shinigami I'm not gonna say it right anyway they're they're like they were called like the death mercenaries essentially and then they were in like the death room essentially which I was like that's fun that's really fun if you know you know like that's a fun extra thing to know um so I thought that was cool I really loved that this show did a really good job at making you feel like you hit rock bottom at several points in the show I think it is called uh, in stories if you know the hero's journey there's a the, the shadow the sh under shadow the darkest moment the dark night of the soul i think it's called the dark night of the soul oh i couldn't remember before when i tried to record this earlier i think it's called the dark night of the soul and it's basically the moment in the story where everything you've hit rock bottom all is lost there's no going up from here you're like there's no way the hero can overcome this part of the story they hit that moment so many times but also made it progressively worse every single time it happened in the story and I feel like that's something that you should be doing when it's an episodic thing like this versus like a movie but it's also really difficult to do and to up it each time and but still in a way that it progresses and doesn't seem unnatural it was very um admirable to see that they were able to accomplish that like I'm not gonna go through all these moments because I'm already like almost at an hour at this point um but some of the moments were like there's a part where the mountain gods are trapped in the paintings and then the yacha is let, I think that's how you say it, is let loose in the hotel and they're separated and they're like, oh my gosh, like, what are we going to do? This is awful. Like, you you almost feel like, how are they going to come back from this? Like, I was like, I don't know how they're going to come back from this, at least the first time I watched it. I, was like, I don't know how this, honestly, I didn't remember fully. I was like, I don't know how they're going to come back from this. Um, and, and then they do. They overcome it and you're like, wow, that's amazing. Like, surely that was the worst of it. Then it gets worse. Later, like, the, the, the gods get poisoned and um, the mermaid Yohi gets bit. And like, and then Ron gets bit and then they can't get to the, the antidote in time. Or maybe they can. We don't know. Like, it doesn't seem like they can, though. Like, that whole thing was crazy. And then, and then Yon's body got swapped and you're like, how is he going? He's like dying. He was already stabbed. 
you're like, how is he going to overcome this? And then they're trapped again. And then there's a whole hypnotizing thing that happens. And then Muyong is dying. And then the and then the mermaid, Yohi, and Jeyu are captured. And they're, they're kidnapped. They're held hostage. And then everyone's split up. And it's this whole thing. You're like, it just, it kept progressively getting worse and worse and worse. And upped and upped and upped. And you're like, oh, I thought they couldn't overcome it last time. And how they're going to overcome this? This is way worse. Like, what are they going to do? And then they overcome it. And it's, it's done in a way that, like, they overcome it. And you're like, wow, I really didn't think that they could do it. And then they did it. They're, like, chilling. You're, like, it almost gives you, like, a, a, a sense of, like, confidence and a sense of calm. You're like, oh, like, whew, we made it through that moment. We can make it through another moment. That's just as bad as this. But then it's not just as bad as this. The next moment that happens, it's, like, ten times worse. And you're like, okay, well, they barely made it through the last one. But they did it. But they barely did it. How are they going to do this? Upping the ante like that, but also satisfy, like, doing it, like, s- resolving it in a way that's still satisfying, but also it's not, like cheesy and doesn't come off as fake I'm not a writer I write sometimes I'm not a writer though you know incredible like it was done so well that I was just like wow that's good and I'm sure like obviously the actors have a part in that but it was like the writing I was just like beautiful so good so 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 good I also really loved the villains in this they did a great job. I'm not talking about Muyong. he did do a great job but like the villains who are just purely villains who don't have redeeming qualities all the Japanese people, the soldiers and the demons. For obvious reasons, they were the villains. <laughs> like, you know, we're not going to remember them. Yeah. Um, but uh, they were really good because during the show, I didn't personally feel any remorse. I didn't feel pity for any of them at any point, even when they were being killed. I really didn't. Like, I didn't feel bad for them. I felt bad for some of the, like, honestly, no, I didn't even feel that bad for the, like, innocents who were dying I felt a little bit like the like one percent bad for them but like especially for like the soldiers and the demons I didn't feel bad for them at all and they were doing some tough stuff like I like to play a mean girl sometimes because I think it's fun um and it's nice to do that in a controlled environment and I'm pretty good at it to be honest not to toot my own horn like I'm pretty good at it though but to be someone purely evil and to like laugh and relish in someone else being tortured or you torturing someone like as an actor like having to like figure out how to play that in a way that feels um realistic and like enough that you can understand why they're doing that is so it takes it takes a lot of talent and a lot of hard work to do that and so I very much admire the actors for being able to do that and make me not like them to that extent because that's that's hard man that's hard and they did a really good job with it especially oh my gosh the guy who ends up uh, i think his name is satori he's ends up being like the fifth secret mercenary that we didn't know about until like the very end um he he plays the dumbest most annoying hypnotist sidekick in the in the beginning where we don't know there's like a twist and it's like oh the guy who was the, he thought was the hypnotist sidekick is actually like this big crazy powerful dude and um he was just so annoying he was so annoying that when they when because there's a moment where he's with dong and like that whole posse and they're in the hotel with the yacha and dealing with that where they sacrifice him to the to one of the yachas they're like listen you tried to kill us earlier like selfishly it wasn't like you he physically pushed them, like but he like he was holding a door and then he left the door and that could have led to the death of like all of them because he was so scared so scared that he ran out when well, now we were like oh he was doing it on purpose and trying to get them killed that's what was happening but like he was just so annoying that it was like i didn't feel bad when he died and then when he came back and i was like of course he's one of the most of course of course and his little transformation in like his looks like obviously that's part of it but also like the way that he um like his whole demeanor and his whole like not essence but like his vibe changed which you know requires some good acting skills like that was very fun to watch i really enjoyed watching that like he did a really good job um something else that i really loved was the countdown that they did in the final episode where they had like a little timer on it was like okay d2 like two days until um 
Yon has to leave with the stone, which we find out later. The re- the whole reason is there's a stone, there's different artifacts. There's four artifacts. One is the stone that was stolen from the future and then he has to go back to the past and get it. That's the whole reason why this whole thing started. And then there's also a golden ruler that's in the past that he, his past, him, his past self has possession of at first until future him comes and takes it literally steals it from him which is a very funny scene by the way um they do this like mirror thing this is really funny um and if the these two artifacts plus two other ones because it's four total are reunited the original mountain god because originally there was one mountain god he went crazy with power so they had to split up couldn't have only one mountain god they split it up into four mountain gods which ends up how um yon hongju and muyang are all mountain gods of different like north south east and west i don't know what the fourth one is i actually don't i don't think they mentioned it really that much unless it was the original mountain god and he ended up being like one of them but i don't think so anyway the if the four artifacts are reunited he'll the original mountain god can come back to life essentially and he'll take over and it'll be the end of the world as we know it um that's the whole like that's the whole big thing um but yon is trying to get the stone back by a certain time one because it's the only time that he's gonna be able to go back to the future (laughs) during the eclipse um (laughs) and two he needs to keep it in a separate time from the ruler which is already because of muyong who thought he was reviving his older brother no it was the original mountain god um that whole thing happened and um he's already reunited him with the golden ruler so now he just needs the three other artifacts we need to get this stone out of here otherwise if he reunites with two artifacts now like he already with the ruler the golden ruler was able to we thought kill muyong he didn't actually but he almost did killed muyong literally just by like i think he like i don't even think he flipped it. he like tapped his forehead and then he was like dead i was like how did that happen okay cool don't know how someone was that powerful and we let that happen and be a thing um the stone needs to go and so there's a timer which mimics the very first episode where there is also a timer counting down the days and i don't think it was days i think it was just time because he only had like a certain amount of hours in the first episode to get back to where he was one because the gate was going to close and two because he needed to get that thing out of there before the mountain god could get his hands on it um and it's mimicking this the same thing from the first episode we have a countdown again and so it one is leading us to believe like well the viewer i think subconsciously will be thinking i don't know if he's gonna make it because he didn't make it the first time there was a timer so i don't know if he's really gonna make it and it also just adds to like the tension and kind of like this intensity like building up because we're watching the clock run out and that makes it a little bit more exciting it makes it a little bit more filled with tension a little bit scarier because we're like is he gonna make it we don't know we don't know um and i thought that that was a really nice touch because it definitely adds some more urgency to what's going on and adds urgency at least to the viewer's eyes so that was like a really really good touch to add into that um again the one like my one really big gripe was that the ending was only semi-satisfying it was a happy ending which was nice we got to kind of wrap up a lot of this sort of wrap up they were kind of left open-ended but wrapped up in a way that it was like okay like they probably like lived happily together essentially um like we see people reunited with their loves we see people um building businesses like building on their businesses we see people going back to their roots and being kind like Mu Young becomes like a traveling doctor for a little while like you know we see all of those things and that's really really nice but the thing that really bothered me was um that the original mountain god was resurrected partially enough at least that he could almost kill Mu Young um and we see as Yon and oh my gosh I literally can't believe I just forgot his name again shinju we see yon and shinju leaving going back to their time with the stone and in there they cut to a shot of the original mountain god like coming around the corner to enter like talipa's place which is where the gate is it's left vague and i know that it was done on purpose and it was done in this way specifically so that way if they do another season there's like a way into that but also it was done vague enough that it's like well maybe but he maybe he didn't make it in time and and we were just showing that he didn't make it in time they were doing it that if there wasn't a third season done that like people wouldn't be like upset that there wasn't a third season done that it wasn't left fully open-ended in a way that was like oh it's set up for a third season but it was done in a way that was like there might be a third season and maybe it bothered me because i want a third season (laughs) 
I would watch a million seasons of the show if it was the same cast doing just different stuff in different time periods. Like I truly would watch it. Um, I love I love all these actors and I love this story and so I I would fully watch it like over and over and over. But I don't know. I was like, ah, oh, like don't like don't tiptoe around it. Like either commit to leaving it like there there's a third season probably and then if you don't do it like did we disappoint people yeah but like you know it was done like it was strong like we we took a stance on it doing it this way where you're like tiptoeing around it it just felt really unsatisfying I was like either do it or don't like I don't want to be stuck in the middle so that left me feeling a little unsatisfied and it was also done in a way that you're like okay but like was it left open-ended or was it not it's almost like it's making you question yourself as the viewer I didn't like that I didn't like that. I was like, am I just being too hopeful? Or are they like actually wanting to do a third season, but they just don't know if it's going to happen. I think that's the case. I don't think I was just me being hopeful. We'll see though. I really do think that they could carry because it, it kind of was left open ended because it's like, where's these other two artifacts? Who's got them? And is this dude, this original mountain god going to go after those? And what's going to happen when he does? I think that's easily a very, it's, I think it's a very easy thing to write to make into a third season or even two more seasons to be honest a third and fourth because you could do one on each artifact well they did two in this one so maybe just one but like to see how that progresses I think people would be, be very interested in that and I think you could easily write that and make it a very compelling story so I hope that they do that but yeah it made the ending like kind of not fall flat but it, it fell short by like 10 percent for me which was like because uh, the rest of it was so good it was so action-packed it was so funny there were so many very real moments in between the actors the relationships were so fun and dynamic and complex and just fun to watch unfold and see how they interact with each other it was just it was a good show um I also really loved by the end of it that Yon um gets his self from 1938 to come and like hang out with his old friends and his brother like he kind of gives them the kick in the butt and is like, all right, we're going to stop with the addiction, with the opium addiction and just like, and really be here for people and help out in whatever way we can, because that's what we should have done in the first place. And I didn't. And he regretted it. And so that was fun to see. It was also cool to see. There's this moment where Yon gives a pep talk to, pep talk to Rang and tells him like, I believe in you and I want you to believe in yourself the same way that I believe in you. And then when he finally gets the opportunity to, first he's like, I can't do it, I can't do it. And then it makes the viewer think like, oh, he really can't do it. And then he does it. And he, in the first season, I believe it's shown that he only has like, when they use, when the Gumihos use their powers, their eyes light up, but Rang is only half. And so only one of his eyes would light up and then the other one wouldn't. Um, And then in this moment, both of his eyes light up. So, I mean, he's still half. So I don't really know exactly how it works, but he's like, I guess, fully stepped into his powers maybe is what it is. That was so cool to see. It was so fun to see. And it leads me to, uh, it was a really good show. I love the show. Spooky, scary, fun. Was there a big lesson takeaway? Because I like to end these with a a lesson. So I guess this is kind of the spoiler free free part. Just heads up. Um, did it lead to a big takeaway maybe not really not necessarily a big takeaway but my takeaway from this would be to believe in yourself which sounds really cheesy but I think it's true I think if you believe in yourself and you surround yourself with people who also believe in you or even if you just have even just having one person who can believe in you I think I've mentioned this before having one person who believes in you and is rooting for you is so important and can be so helpful and I think can really change your life especially if it leads to you fully and like actually believing in yourself and I think I'm going to talk about this in my next podcast a little bit more in depth um fake it till you make it which is essentially believing in yourself even when it seems really hard to I think I I I I believe it really can change your life because I really think it's changed mine just believing in myself I'm gonna talk about it later in a different podcast maybe some manifesting things a little bit um and what I think about manifesting and what it means to me because it might not mean what you think it means like to me what it means might not mean what it means to you I don't know if any of that made sense but yeah I think that's gonna be my next podcast but I really do believe in like if you believe in yourself and even if you have to fake it till you make it and you fake believing in yourself and then you just tell yourself over over and over that you believe in yourself and you can do anything you want until you start to believe it but believing in yourself I think can really change your life and can really change how you approach your life and the people in your life I think that's really important so yeah I guess that's my lesson but also like go watch this show if you haven't 
um if i spoiled it for you listen that was that's your own fault i really i put markers in there for you man i really did in the beginning if i spoiled it a little bit okay maybe that's a little on me because that was kind of an accident but i am gonna mark those down so don't worry about that but um like man it's a good show believe in yourself and also go watch this show if you have it because it's so good um it's a fun easy watch it's very fast paced it's easy to binge go check it out it was really good and the acting's incredible and the storytelling is incredible so yeah really good show and believe in yourself <laughs> um thanks for sticking around this long if you did i hope you enjoyed it i hope you have a lovely rest of your day evening morning weekend week week i was gonna say weekday and then i was like that doesn't make sense week lovely rest of your week whatever it is for you thank you so much for sticking around hanging out with me um and i hope to see you next time all right love michaela <laughs> bye <laughs>